Hi, I'm David Searing, and I'm excited to be your instructor for the Community Engagement class for the Masters of Professional Studies and Creative Leadership program. Before I talk further, I want to tell you a story to introduce you to a friend that I work with often in my community-engaged research. Anna Victoria knits quickly. She can start the day with an idea and a ball of yarn, and by evening, she will have a sweater halfway completed. She's made her living from the craft of her hands for decades. Whether she knits, sews, or beads, her hands move fast, pulling stitches into place. She teaches me. She teaches her daughter. She teaches the others when they stop by with questions. Her hands are always moving. And Anna likes to play, to laugh, and she likes to get everybody laughing and doing things together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ahora en quichua. Hoy en quichua. Chu, ishkay, kimsa, chusku, pichka, sukta, kanchis, pusa, iskun, chunka. Right, para ver. Es bien, es bien. Oye, yo sí tengo. No era de poner hoy esta. Por eso sí que no era de poner aquí. Hoy es esta línea de celular. Tres, tres, y en tres colores, y en ese otro azul, otro café. Y está con margarita. ¿sí? Mire, esta, para hacer un para color, hacer este, ah, color, ah, este color en blanco. To bead, Anna Victoria sets a low table on the porch and covers it with a cloth. We sit on small benches to work. As she starts a new piece, she pins her work to the cloth to keep it secure to keep it from flying loose and scattering beads, to keep it from twisting as she begins. As we work, it grows misty, a cool, damp breeze rolling down the mountainside. Anna shivers, hugs herself. Chachai, she says. Que frío. We are often cold physically as we sit outside. But I feel wrapped in the strands of connectedness that Anna Victoria knits around herself and her family. This village in the mountains of southern Ecuador lies distant from global politics, but close to the powers of community that have motivated humans for millions of years. Anna Victoria is a center of that power. I know I am lucky to know her. I've learned so much about community engagement from Anna Victoria and other people who have shared their time and knowledge with me. I often call Anna Victoria mi maestra, or my teacher, when I'm visiting with her. Learning with community is the foundation of my work. I want to use this video you are watching now to introduce you to some of the community-engaged work that I've done over the past 20 years. In this video, I'm going to briefly highlight examples of my community-engaged research You'll find links, links to each of the items I mentioned in the module on Canvas that's called David's Community Engaged Research. Feel free to look at them in more depth as you have time and interest. I'm also willing to discuss these throughout the semester, so please bring questions to class, uh, talk to me in person, or uh, in our online discussion spaces, bring it up if you have questions about it. So, I actually moved to Duluth not for an academic job. I started in this region as an organizer. From the beginning, I've not had a sense of my work here as being separate from or isolated from the community. I first worked for Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness, an advocacy organization that highlights the value of the Boundary Waters for our region and the state. After that, I worked for a couple years as the Duluth organizer for the Minnesota Environmental Partnership, which is a statewide coalition of environmental groups. I focused on building the capacities of community members, 
community members and organizations to participate in political and civic processes that shape public policies related to the environment. So my sense of self uh, here in Duluth is rooted in being connected to the community, including the human beings that are here, but also the larger ecological community. As an academic, I've done a lot of community-engaged research in our region, especially focused on local food and farming. In 2009, I worked with a farmer from Finland, Minnesota, David Abaz, um, of Round River Farm, and with a GIS specialist, Stacy Stark, from the UMD Spatial Lab, uh, to define a regional food chip for the Western Lake Superior region. That work was funded by the Healthy Food, Healthy Lives Institute of the University of Minnesota and resulted in a report that set out the potential for a more locally adapted food system in our region. There's been a lot of work throughout the region on this issue, and our report has helped provide a research grounding to support action and policies for food systems development. I said I'm currently working on another food systems research project with David Abaz again. He's now the Northeast Regional Sustainable Development Partnership Coordinator. I'm also working with Brian Bloom, who's the Regional Statewide Health Improvement Partnership Coordinator for an organization called Healthy Northland. Brian is, coincidentally, a former undergrad student from UMD's anthropology program, and he also has a master's degree from UMD focused on sustainability and education. Together, we will be researching what kinds of experiential education and internships in farming lead people to gather the skills necessary to become farmers. Two undergraduate students from our ANTH program will get the chance for paid, community-engaged research on this project. They'll be interviewing farmers and interns about their experiences. As this previous example suggests, I often draw students into the community-engaged research work that I do. For example, in 2013, students in my ethnobotany course created an hour-long documentary on growing food in the region. It profiled four farms and communicated some of the findings from the research that David, Stacy, and I completed together. It premiered at the Zinema Theater with an overflow crowd, including the farmers who were in the film, and is on the Vimeo streaming platform for streaming. Here's a brief clip from the film. This film is about one local food system and four sets of farmers growing food in the Western Lake Superior region. Our region spans 13 million acres of Minnesota and Wisconsin. 10 million of those acres are fit for farming. Our region is shared by 479,856 people. People who spend $1.2 billion on food per year. Just 7% of our food is grown and eaten locally. 93% of our food isn't. However, studies show that we can produce enough food to feed our entire region. So if we can feed ourselves, why aren't we? My name is John Key Fisher Marin, and I run the food farm in Renshaw, Minnesota. We love what we do on the food farm. It, it takes a lot of work, but it also takes a lot of creativity and um, community involvement. And uh, but the our whole focus is is providing food for people and building community around that. Last semester, in the fall of 2019, students in another round of the ethnobotany course made an update to this 2013 film. It features segments on Round River Farm, on Fairhaven Farm, on the UMD Land Lab, on Charlie Danielson's work at Up North Farm with mushrooms as soil builders, and a segment on indigenous food sovereignty issues. 
I'm hoping to have a premiere of the, this finished film at the Zinema later in the spring or early summer. Here's a brief sample from the segment on indigenous food sovereignty. To me, food sovereignty is it's a very, uh, very broad term. A sovereignty in the, in the context of Native American tribes, of course, you know, there are sovereign entities essentially functioning on a nation to nation basis between the United States government and uh, federally recognized tribes. And then the aspect of food, how that's tied to sovereignty is our, our ability to feed ourselves. Food sovereignty is a response to the unhealthy foods that many of us turn to because that's what we can afford and that's what we have time to prepare after we're done working our long days. Food sovereignty is a response to this government's failure to honor its treaties. Food sovereignty is replacing food from giant corporations with food from our communities where shareholder profit is not more important than our health and our dignity. I think about food sovereignty then I guess as um, as the the authority that a collective group of people, that a nation, uh, that, that a tribal nation, that's the authority that they have over their food systems. I guess as a Ojibwe person, um, having access to wild rice is a big part of food sovereignty and being able to protect the wild rice. Other community-engaged projects from my courses include a Twin Ports community plant story map and a story map of emotions in the Twin Ports landscape. These story maps are ongoing projects that get updated every few years as part of the coursework for my undergraduate students. I've also done research in our region for nonprofit groups, including conducting focus group research on mining issues and helping community groups use digital storytelling to communicate their work. For example, I helped a Detroit neighborhood group make this digital story. It was a trash collection day when squatters on West Grand Boulevard stole freshly emptied containers and filled them with waste from weeks of illegal occupancy. Frustrated tenants called their landlords to report yet another incident of unsavory behavior. Tommy wasn't home when Mildred was roused by a ringing phone that rattled her teacup. In aid of curing a tenacious influenza, she lulled in a curative dose, but the energy of outrage propelled her into action, and she was dressed and into her car. Finding squatters loading trash in containers clearly stenciled with tenant's address, she strode toward them, insisting that the containers be emptied and returned. She felt no trepidation or restraint, and the squatters, with minimal resistance, dumped their trash and rolled the dumpsters back. Police arrived to a barrage of complaints and listened with professional respect. Squatters have rights under the law, they explained, but acceded to pleas for intervention. The squatters had retreated behind the front door when the officers climbed the stairs. Onlookers soon felt relief when the squatters loaded a makeshift cart and left. This incident inspired Tommy and Mildred to call a meeting of neighbors, and when security officer John Weigel took their call at Henry Ford Hospital, he offered to host the impromptu meeting that was the founding of the West Grand Boulevard Collaborative. Our first accomplishments included successful appeals to Ombudsman Doreen Brown that resulted in boarding vacant buildings and to Councilwoman Joanne Watson that restored streetlights in our community. Our expanded mission includes safety, beautification, and community building programs, 
such as the Clean and Safe Environment Initiative and the Mary and Albert H. Mallory Reading Garden at the Duffield Branch Library. Sterling examples of projects that make communities safe, beautiful, and sustainable. So these are a few examples of the kinds of community-engaged work that I've done locally. As an anthropologist, I also do community-engaged qualitative research with an indigenous community in the Ecuadorian Andes. The Saraguro people of Ecuador are actually the folks who taught me how important community engagement is for a researcher. Here, for example, is another story featuring Benigno Congo, one of the community members that I work most closely with in Ecuador. Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche. Escribir, por ejemplo, la noche está estrellada y tiritan azules los astros a lo lejos. El viento de la noche gira en el cielo y canta. My friend Benigno tells great stories. He tells them well. I'm a great listener. Sometimes when Benigno tells me stories, he will say before he begins, it's a story, but it's true. One day, we climb a footpath towards his house in Tuncarta, Ecuador. As Benigno and I walk, we pass an old stone orno, an oven in the gloaming. Benigno says, about 20 years ago, a teenage girl, someone I went to school with, was walking home late from a fiesta when she passed this oven. As she passed, she felt two hands pressing down on her shoulder from behind. But when she turned, no one was there. The next day, she got sick. Within eight days, she died. I visited her while she was dying. She was curled up, unable to move. Oír la noche inmensa, más inmensa sin ella. Y el verso cae al alma como al pasto el rosario. Benigno doesn't say that the weight of ghostly hands on her shoulders killed that girl. He says the mal aire, the bad air that she got that night, killed her. As we climb the last hundred yards of the hill, Benigno stops to show me a plant he calls Ai Chilchi, an eight-foot shrub with small yellow flowers. He often stops to show me plants. He knows I'm interested in them, and he knows a lot about them and their uses. This is good for mal aire, he says, and pulls off a short branch, and for susto, especially if you are frightened by an animal. He swats gently on my legs and body to show how to use the plant, and I'm surrounded by a medicinal, not unpleasant smell as the leaves and flowers release their volatile oils. Benigno has told me he wants me to share his stories. I feel ghostly hands on my shoulders as I speak. Benigno is generous to share his stories. I am thirsty to know how life can be lived fully and well in place. So much more to learn, I say, as we walk up the hill. There's always so much more to learn. I started visiting Saraguro in 2005. And from the beginning, I saw that my presence there needed to benefit the community and not just my own agendas as a researcher. When I apply for grants to travel there, I always include funding to give to community members. I also stay in community members' homes and pay them for room and board. 
It's important for university researchers to understand that when communities work with us, they should be properly included in designing the research and properly recompensed for their time and their knowledge. In Saraguro, I connected strongly with bead artists, mostly women, who work together to both to enhance their skills as artists and to serve their community. They seek their own financial independence and they help one another and the community to thrive. The women's cooperative Las Mujeres de Teresa de Calcuta meets every week to bead together, plan contributions by the group to community events, and build solidarity amongst the women. They invited me into their work, and I've been going back every year or so to learn more, to help them find markets for their work, and to draw attention to their, their unique culture and lives. For example, I'll be leaving in May, two days after we finish this course, to visit Saraguro for three weeks. When I go, I'll be bringing the women proceeds from the beadwork sales that I've made whenever I speak publicly about Saraguro. I'll also be offering an Allworth Center brown bag on April 2nd this semester, where I will talk about our work together. In about 2012, I showed up in Saragoto with some camera equipment purchased from a grant that I got here at UMD. The women and I worked together that summer to make an hour-long documentary about their arts and their agriculture. The women planned what each of them would demonstrate to fully represent the range of their arts. We filmed in each of their homes. Here's a short excerpt of that film. Tejen juntas, ¿no? Sí, sí tejemos juntas para poder hacer para hacer más rápido y cuando uno se está solito ya no no se teje así como estando entre dos o tres entonces hacemos incluso para corregirse mismo sí para no ver si está mal o ya nos preguntamos a veces ya toca aumentar entonces ya nos preguntamos si ya estará de aumentar o todavía no ya nos ayudamos aquí entre las dos somos tres aún no viene la Aún no viene la Ana todavía. Ah, ya, ya. Sí. Entonces con ella sabemos tejer. ¿Hace cuántos años integra el grupo? Yo eh, voy a ajustar ahora en... Ahora en mayo voy a ajustar cinco años que integre, me integré al grupo de mujeres. Uh -huh. El grupo Teresa de Calcuta. Sí. Entonces desde hace cinco años teje los mullos. Sí, bueno, teje, teje casi ahora, en, hace unos cuatro años, porque yo cuando empecé a tejer, eh, ingresé al grupo, yo no sabía tejer. Ay, 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 ay. Yo no sabía tejer y, y ahí me demoré bastante. En hacer un, una pieza, un tejido, yo me demoré un año. Entonces al año yo, yo acabé de tejer un tejido y sí fue un poco dificultoso, pero... Pero luego también aprendí, aprendí a hacer. Cuando ya me casé, ya fue distinto vivir en una comunidad uh -huh. y en el cual eh, ahí se ve la organización, que es mucho mejor. Entonces la iniciativa, como que yo entré a un grupo de mujeres, fue por mi suegra. Porque eh, el tiempo que, bueno, toda mi juventud, desde que yo fui soltera, yo trabajaba en el en el comercio y luego de un tiempo mi esposo migró, él tuvo que migrar a otro país y, y después de un tiempo también yo me estaba yendo a ir y como ya no, no me pude ir y yo dejé mi, mi lugar de trabajo y ya no pude volver otra vez allá, entonces la preocupación mía sí era eh, ahora cómo yo voy a, a obtener recursos para, para mí, no porque tal vez mi esposo no, no me daba, sino que ya uno es acostumbrado a trabajar y, uh -huh. y a tener algo. Entonces, eso siempre era mi preocupación. A veces yo decía, ¿y ahora qué hago? ¿Qué voy a hacer? Yo no sabía hacer nada de estas cosas. Entonces, mi suegra, ella me dice un día, dice, ¿te gustaría dice este, estar en un grupo de mujeres? Dice ella. 
le digo, claro, digo, ¿por qué me van a recibir? Digo, ella es técnica, a lo menos yo no sé nada. Entonces ella dice, no, dice, ya te voy a dar hablando yo. Y así ella se había ido a darme hablando con mamá lejita. Le había dicho que si yo podía ingresar a un grupo de mujeres y ella había dicho que sí, que, que venga nomás. Y fue así que yo me fui un, un día martes, siempre más antes se reunían los martes en la casa de mamá leja. Entonces yo me fui y habían estado las mujeres tejiendo y todo. Yo ingresé ahí, llegué y, y me recibieron bien todas las mujeres de ahí. Y desde ahí, entonces ellas ya me pusieron ahí, yo ya vi que ellas tejían y entonces ellas me decían, bueno, que ya también debía aprender. Entonces, eh, ellas me enseñaron ahí, eh, me enseñaron hasta coger una aguja porque yo no podía hacer nada. Uh -huh. Y ahí empecé a aprender a tejer y, y sí, me demoré como digo un año en hacer un, una Bastante. pieza, claro. <risa> una pieza, pero ya ahora ya es, es, ya es fácil, ya no es... No es difícil. Y, y entrando al grupo de mujeres es donde uno se aprende igual a hacer más en la organización mismo, cualquier cosa que se tenga. Es como estar, a lo menos yo me considero como una familia al estar ya en el grupo de mujeres. Cualquier cosa nos estamos riendo, eh, a veces lloramos, a veces también peleamos, pero como creo que en todo grupo todo. es así, sí. Entonces... Es, es bonito y, y gracias también a, a, a lo que he aprendido a tejer, eh, me sirve a mí para mis recursos económicos en mi casa, poder ayudar a, en mi casa y también gracias a, a esos recursos que nosotros como mujeres hemos emprendido en hacer, también hemos obtenido dinero con esas ganancias, hemos comprado un lote en el cual ahora estamos eh, ya para ver si construimos una casa que sea propia para el Grupo Teresa de Calcuta. I've also published a book about our work together that was published by the University of Texas Press in 2014. When I showed up with that camera gear, members of a youth group immediately said, hey, that looks like good equipment. We want to make a video of our traditional dances. You can help us. Here's the video that we made together. The group members did all the thinking and planning for this project. They set the dates to film, chose the location, arranged logistics for the outing, and more. In fact, most of the camera work in this video was done by Benigno, who was interested in learning how to use the camera. I have since uh, purchased a camera and a tripod and sound equipment and left it with them to use for their own purposes when I'm not there. When it was time to edit this dance video, three of the dancers sat with me and we collectively uh, edited together in a collaboration. This video now has about 600,000 views on YouTube, which is a testament to the way that community-engaged work has power and reach when it serves the community involved. Nothing I write in academic context will ever have such a wide audience.
I've gone on to work with the Sarugoro collaborators to make a short documentary about a musical group, Amaru, who are preserving and expanding cultural traditions of their community. Here's a bit of that film. El nombre nace eh, es un es una palabra en quichua y significa fuerza. Bueno, en el quichua de Saraguro significa serpiente, pero en el el quichua de en el idioma aymar significa fuerza o valentía. Entonces nos, nos motiva y nos inspira para poder llevar y poner el nombre en nuestra agrupación. Amaru en el quichua significa, significa serpiente, pero en el aymara significa fortaleza, entonces más o menos se podría dar un, un, un significado como jóvenes eh, que tienen fuerza para, sacar, eh, para proyectar sus sueños y sacar adelante la música de Saragura. I've also gone on to work with a, an artist, Sotogoro artist named Freddy Guayas, to highlight his work. Here's a look at that. Hola de nuevo, mi nombre es eh, Freddy, soy de la provincia de Loja, Cantón Saraguro, eh, habito en una de las 13 comunidades indígenas de, de Saraguro, la comunidad de Tuncarta, cerca de 120 a 130 familias. Eh, bueno, yo inicio en el arte o me doy cuenta que mi inclinación por el arte es cuando cursaba... And I've created a number of digital stories about my work in Soto Girl, like the two that I've shown you already. I also seek to support community-engaged work by my colleagues and their students. With Dr. Mitra Ahmad, I co-founded the Participatory Media Lab at UMD, which supports our work, the work of our students, the work of students in other classes, and the work of other professors at UMD who want to do community-engaged participatory media production. Here's an excerpt from a longer video that Dr. Imad and I created to explain the participatory media lab, which we often refer to as the PML. Screen. Laboratory is a notion of innovation, of experimentation, but it's also a site, a place, a situation, a set of conditions. The lab itself is not about necessarily figuring out the technology. For me, the PML represents a shift in focus towards media production towards participatory field engagements, towards the question that I even brought to my field site a month ago, which was simply, what can I do for you? How can my project and my capacities be of service to you? But what I really talked about was my capacity of observation, deep listening, and knowledgeable engagement. The lab comes in as a way to allow me to think about the field in terms of what I can bring to the mission of those around me. That isn't only about technology. We're also developing the lab as 
a collegial space and and bringing the lab as an opportunity to our interdisciplinary colleagues, it's also not just about technology. Other faculty have been able to talk to us about what participatory media and participatory production in their research models might look like. People who aren't anthropologists, people who are wanting to do an ethnographic piece in a project. So the capacity for us to share like digital storytelling techniques and workshops to share the the sort of philosophical ideas behind this lab and why we have this equipment and what what we want to do with it and how that's helped shape other people's projects and ideas their creativity and their focus and their capacity to do something in their projects that they might not have done otherwise has also been emboldened i think For all of us engaging in this specific laboratory, the Participatory Media Lab, this lab comes along with us, carrier bag style, as we move from our participatory field sites into media production and back to our stakeholders with the question, what can we do? What can we create? How can we facilitate your story? I have other examples that I can share and will share throughout the rest of the semester, but I suspect that this introductory video has gone on long enough. Uh, You get a clear idea that community engagement is central to all of the research and teaching that I do. So I look forward to working with each of you to develop your own research skills and to encourage you to embrace a community-engaged framework, not only for the work that you do for this class or the work that you're going to do for your master's thesis, but also for your longer term life projects and activities. We need educated people who are passionate about the communities that we live in and who can serve our communities with collaborative research to answer important community questions. As the course progresses, please visit me early and often about how we can shape the course to serve your educational goals and ways that I can support your work. I'll see you next Tuesday evening Come ready to talk about your passions, your potential research ideas, and be ready to get, begin to get to know what looks to be a really interesting group of people who are seeking community-engaged thinking and action together. Have a great weekend.